Welcome to this episode of the DHF Podcast. I'm your host, Sam, and I'm so thankful to be here with Rick Grace, who's our uh, church liaison for DHF. Say hi, Rick. Hi to you, not only to you, Sam, but to everybody that's that's tuning into this podcast. it's good to do this again with you, my friend. It's been a while since uh, since we've had the the opportunity to share the mic together. I, I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, and our last one was a great one. I always encourage folks, if you've missed one, go back and check it out. Um, uh, we had a, a young lady on that was a really wonderful uh, conversation mm-hmm. about suffering and singleness. Uh, but now we're going to go in an opposite direction. <laughs> and kind of the opposite of singleness. <laughs> that's right. We're going to discuss something kind of practical, uh, not too long ago, I, I actually had someone in my previous congregation say, hey, uh, I'm about to do my first wedding. I got asked to do my niece's wedding. What do I do? And so maybe this is your first time. Maybe you just want to improve. Today, me and Rick are going to take some turns sharing tips and advice that we've learned through ministry about what to do and how to do a wedding. Rick, you want to just kick us off with number one, and we're just going to kind of go back and forth. And we hope you that are listening uh, occasionally, maybe if something strikes you, take a note. Take a note. Sure. Um, My recommendation uh, to pastors and churches around the country, number one, is to have a printed wedding policy in place. You know, in today's litigious culture, having a printed policy with the biblical predications of why you will or won't do that uh, particular wedding, honestly can help you from getting sued somewhere for for some form of discrimination. Um, in, in your in your wedding policy, you can you can designate things um, like we we only marry a believer to a believer. You can designate how many sessions of premarital preparation you have. You can designate in your policy, and I encourage churches to do this, to use Genesis 1 and 2 and the whole story of of, of Adam and Eve as the basis of their policy, and that we will only do weddings that involve a man and a woman. If it's printed and you treat everybody the same, as I understand it, that gives you the coverage that you need. Um, If a couple that doesn't fit your definition of marriage, wants to use either you or your facility. Um, and then, Sam, let me say this, and then we can we can move on to your first one. I have some samples of wedding policies, um, and I don't know that we can put them in the show notes, but if, if somebody is interested in looking at a pretty detailed wedding policy, I would be more than happy to make some of those templates available um, to churches and pastors. Um, let's face it, Today you got to cover your backside, and the best way to start is with a with a printed policy that don't just have it enforce it. <laughs> and Rick, I'm sure the policy examples that you have are are great, and people can go there. If for some reason you don't want to email Rick and you want to go straight to say a lawyer, Pacific Justice Institute has some policies, mm-hmm. things like that. Uh, some of those kinds, they're not the only ministry like that. Have some of those out there that have been lawyer vetted. Uh, that you could use, and they protect not only your church, they might also protect just your staff uh, because they can hold that up as a shield going, hey, it doesn't matter how much um, you are my friend, we can't use the facility for this or or whatever. They can't be kind of pushed or pressured into it. Uh, And I certainly have appreciated that. And uh, uh, I won't make this my first point. I'll skip skip one, but I would just want to amen that marrying a believer to a believer it's biblical. I have encountered folks that, well, this is an evangelism moment. If I reach out into the community or, you know, and, and I, on one hand, maybe you have a good heart there and I, I can kind of appreciate that, but this is a serious lifelong covenant and you are not going to get marriage in, until you get the Holy Spirit loving your wife or your husband through you. Uh, and you're going to really need to understand grace if you're going to have a successful marriage. So please Amen. do that. But but my real number one point, besides the bonus point, forgive me, specifically when I had that gentleman from my church, um, he he was part of our leadership team. He was a deacon uh, and we we trusted him to do a ton of things. And this was the first time he had ever been asked to do a wedding. And my first piece of advice was relax. 
The mm-hmm. focus is not going to be on you. You probably are going to mix some words up here or there, uh, but very practically, they're going to remember the bride and maybe the groom. <laughs> maybe. He's there, <laughs> right? Maybe. But the focus is on that bride. It is her day. Everyone's going to be looking at her. They're going to see if she cries. They're going to see her dress and the flowers that she's holding. They might notice some of the music that's played, but that's where their eyes are. You're almost window dressing. I don't want to inappropriately downplay it because this is a sacred vow. You represent the Lord in this. Really, a lot of that is the premarital counseling and the postmarital counseling. But in that moment, it's okay if you slip your words up. Okay, don't panic. <laughs> the most important thing is you attach a name on the wedding license. That's all. That's, and I, Sam, that that was kind of joking. But the first wedding I did in Kansas after I moved to that congregation um, was called to that congregation. I forgot. I mailed the the wedding license back without my signature on it. And in, in, in that state, if you didn't get the, the wedding license signed and back to the county clerk within 10 days, they started fining you $100. Oh, <laughs> no. And I thought, oh, my goodness. So I get this call from the, from the county clerk. You need to get here and sign this. <laughs> so make sure we'll throw that one in at no extra cost. Make sure you <laughs> sign the license. <laughs> I don't think I've... Done that yet? I have, I have in California. I paid money when I didn't have to, and they sent it back. They're like, no, 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 that was for the duplicate. You don't have to pay money. I was like, oh, I. <laughs> but I at least always signed it. Let me hit my number two, and I learned this one the hard way because a lot of times, if a couple, you Sam, I don't know if this has happened to you, but often a couple will come to you immediately after the service on Sunday morning and say, hey, we've, we want to get married, and we want you to do the service for us. Never say yes at that moment. Never say yes. All I agree to at that point is, yes, I will agree to sit down and talk with you, and I will share with you our wedding policy on what the church and I require, but I want you to know I won't actually say yes until our premarital preparation is completed. Because we may discover something along the way that biblically or emotionally, spiritually, whatever, indicates to all of us that this is not, this is not a good decision to go forward with that. I've, Sam, I've had a couple that came to me at the end of a service and asked me if I would do their wedding. And I said, I will agree to meet with you. And they looked at me and said, but we've already got our invitations printed. I don't care. (laughs) So I never say yes. And I reserve the right to not say yes until the end of the premarital preparation is done. Uh, Excellent call. And and I'll kind of add to it as I have had to say no. And don't be afraid to say no. That's right. Um, you don't want to, you know, I had somebody that they were deployed, came back, wanted to marry their high school sweetheart. They had connections in the church, but the high school sweetheart was not a believer. And I didn't really know this gentleman enough to know if he was a bona fide believer, if he had just been dunked in water at some point and then deployed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was hoping I was going to, you know, give him grace as much as possible. But I asked a few questions and I, and they wanted Got to be this weekend. Sorry, that's not enough time. I'm going to have to decline. And, you know, I got a little flack for that. That's okay. And on the related side, there was someone who we sat down and we did the counseling. It was, you know, one hour this week, met again another week and did an hour. And then you, by the end of it, they looked at each other and said, you know what? I don't think we should get married. And they ended up breaking up. And that may have seemed mean, but I count that as a success because there was no covenant made and then broken later. Yeah. Figured out in advance. I I would require at minimum four to six sessions with every couple. Now I realize because I've got a counseling background, my master's is in pastoral counseling. That's a little bit, maybe more in my wheelhouse, if you would. Um, but I 
Yeah, I, I never say yes the first time I'm asked. I think that's good. And speaking of counseling, my my number two is pre and post marital counseling. Uh, I know that you can't really hold it to them. I, I hold it, hold them to it, right? All right, I've got the certificate, I've signed, whatever. But in reality, no matter how much you think you know about marriage, you know, somewhere between six months to a year in, they're going to understand marriage in a whole new way. And at that point, they really could use a pastor. They really could have some some guided conversations about what they've learned and and how they can best move forward and and love one another in light of all these kinds of things and probably be reminded of all those things that you told them in advance that they were only listening to, to get your signature. And then Mm -hmm. now they really need. (laughs) So have that, you know, pull out the love languages book or (laughs) it might take a year in before they read it. Nancy and I, often do premarital preparation together with couples. So they're hearing not only from me, but also they get the female perspective as well. And we make sure that we tell every premarital couple is that we can virtually guarantee between their six month anniversary and one year anniversary, they will wake up, they will look across the bed and they will either say it out loud or they will think it, what the, Heaven have I done. (laughs) And we tell every couple that. We tell them that so it's not a surprise when that happens in their relationship. And not only what have I done, but at some point, who is this? (laughs) Did I did I actually know this person? The the only Nancy and I, okay, honest self-disclosure, okay. We did not hit a time between six months and one year where we honestly looked at that 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 little bit of introspective moment and said, what have I done? For us, it happened on day 366. (laughs) We had had the worst fight the day after our first anniversary that we have now had in 49 years. (laughs) let Let me get to my three, Sam, so we can make sure we progress down our lists. I encourage pastors, elders, whoever's doing the wedding to focus more on the marriage than on the wedding. Okay. Every bride in most every couple want, let's talk about the ceremony. And any idiot can plan a ceremony. (laughs) That's not what you're paying me for. I I adopt the posture. I am your marriage consultant. Will we talk about the wedding? Yes. But it will be at the end process of using tools to help do some excellent, hopefully, premarital preparation. Sam, let's let's talk. Can we talk about that for a second? Absolutely. I I use, excuse me, Nancy and I use one of two tools. And I wanted to mention these, and if you want to put them in the show notes or, or whatever, the, the, the tool I am most familiar with is an inventory called Prepare, which stands, it's an acrostic for premarital, personal, and relationship evaluation, okay? It was written by uh, uh, Christians, actually, uh, from um, um, David Olson was the primary uh, shaper behind that. Um, premarital, personal and relationship evaluation. Okay. Wonderful tool. You have to have a certification. You have to go through the training in order to be able to use it. But when you use it, you get back a 24 page printout that e- even if you haven't had that much experience in premarital preparation or in, in counseling in general, it gives you the direction that you're going to need to go with that couple. Now, the other tool that Nancy and I often use is called Symbis, S-Y-M-B-I-S. That one I'm more familiar with. Yeah. Okay. And that one was written by doctors Les and Leslie Parrott, husband and wife team that at that time taught at Seattle Pacific University. And it stands for saving your marriage before it starts. Symbis. Okay. And on that one, you get a 26-page printout. (laughs) Not that, you know, not that 
not that the, the, the number of pages is important, but you get an incredible amount of information back, which gives you a good indication of the direction that you need to take in their, in their, in their um, premarital prep. The prepare inventory over the years, because it's, it's been around now probably 20, 30, 40 years, has an 80% success rate in predicting the success of the marriage. Okay, so it's it's been time tested. Those are those are two tools that I use. Uh, what about you? What uh, what's kind of your go to for premarital prep? You know, I cheat in that I had a wonderful premarital counselor uh, before my myself and Heather got married, and so I have a pile of handwritten notes and things like that that he had us do and go through, and a couple of key books uh, like the Five Love Languages. So we. Okay. I want people to identify what those are for one another like, so that they're going in there knowing, all right, I don't know which comedian said this, but someone once said that guys, they'll tell you they love you and they'll let you know if something changes, right? But women actually need to hear I love you often. Now, it varies mm -hmm. a bit, but we go through kind of that cheat sheet that I have. Now, I would love to get into Simbus at some point. That's been on one of those wish list kinds of things for sure. me. Sure. So let's go ahead and mention that book again. It's it's The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman, Dr. Gary Chapman, who is, when he wrote it, uh, he, he'd been a marriage and family therapist for, for 25 years. So he brings the, all that experience in, into that text as well. Um, and one of the things that he reflects in that is rarely do two people marry, marry each other who have the same primary love language. And what I found is not even in, in premarital counseling, there are times where I'm counseling folks well into their marriage, there's something else going on and you see it. You mm -hmm. see that, oh, this death is harder and these two are having conflict right now because as they're trying to mourn so-and-so, they're not speaking their love languages to each other and they're not hearing this, so they're not really supporting one another in the way it can be received. Uh, and even a family member recently, I was like, okay, if I got you this book, <laughs> would you read it? Because I know that's not what we're talking about, but I think it would help you a whole lot. <laughs> All right, you're number three. This is one's very practical for the wedding itself. Ask what the colors are. Actually, more simply, ask what they want you to wear. They might want you in the standard black uh, suit, black tie, they may also want you, if you've got a family connection, to be matching one of the colors, or they might want it to be less formal if you're you know, doing an outdoor wedding, any of those things. Ask, be their servant. This is something that you can be super flexible on and just kind of roll with it. That's good. That's good. I hate being in wedding pictures, but I can almost guarantee you that somewhere in there, they're going to want a picture, the couple in the past or the whole wedding party in the past or so it's at least when it comes to that, I do try to blend in. Um, you're, uh, you've got more practical. Let me, <laughs> let, let, me, let me do one that I've learned kind of the hard way, okay? I tell the couple before the wedding rehearsal starts is that I will be their protector for the evening. Sam, I don't know if you've experienced this, but I've had some wonderful suggestions I'll put that in air quotes, halfway through the rehearsal from one, if not both of the mother-in-laws on how the wedding could be improved if we just follow their suggestion. I don't want the couple to start with one of them having to say to their mother-in-law, no. So I tell the couple going in, when it comes to the rehearsal, if there is a suggestion from either of your mothers, I will step if not physically, I will step emotionally, verbally in between you and the mother-in-law to say, and I'll just tell them, thank you for that suggestion, but this is the couple's wedding. They've already worked out the details. Now, if they want to incorporate that, I will talk with them later, but we're not going to entertain that right now. And just let me be the bad guy, okay? So that if, if there's an unsolicited suggestion from the mother-in-law Zilla or whatever you want to call it. I suspect many young men are forever in your debt. I mean, women and men, of course, but uh, I think <laughs> and, and, and maybe more one than the other. Well, I've, I've had to do that numerous times of, 
of protecting the couple from starting from, I, I don't want them to have to say no to their future mother-in-law and get off to a rocky start. So let me do it for you. Another practical one, make sure if you're having the, the service in your church building, that it's ready for visitors. Now you should know this anyways. Every church should have clear restroom signs up. We want our guests to feel welcome because we want our guests to become disciples. They're first time visitors. I don't even know if I like the term guests because it might imply they're there and they're not gonna be there next time. Uh, then that might happen sometimes if there's a family visitor or something like that, but really you want those visitors to become disciples. So prep them, help them feel comfortable. If you've got an event or something like that going on and you still do some paper stuff on the wall, leave it up, keep it prominent. Maybe you'll get someone that can see them and kind of related to that, it may not be in your building. Your building may have a separate policy that helps determine whether you're able to do a wedding in your building or not. We only did it inside of our building at the fountain if it someone was a member. Otherwise, we need to get some extra approval, something like that. Here's another you know, maybe practical suggestion. I asked the couple and encouraged them to write their own vows. You know, if they want a traditional wedding, yeah, I'm good with that as well. But if they, if they want to put their own personal stamp on this, then I encourage them to write their own vows. But I do this with one proviso that any vow they write, I have to be able to justify biblically or it's, it's, it's not gonna become part of the service. I, I, and, and really in 49 years, I've only had to override a couple once. And they had written their, they, and they had some really, really neat personal expressions of the vows they were making to each other. But when it got down to the very end, it was, not as long as we both shall live or something like that. It was, I, and I promise to keep this vow as long as we both love each other. <laughs> yeah. Time out, time out. <laughs> but that's nice try. Me, that's like that, changing yeah. the fine print there. Ooh, ooh. But that gave me a wonderful example to be able to do, you know, to use that as a teaching moment. The, the one thing I remember from Nancy's and my wedding that took me, I think, 10 years to really grasp, our pastor that performed our ceremony looked at us and said, I'm not going to ask you today whether or not you love each other, because I don't think that's very important. And I'm going, I can remember almost having a visceral reaction. What do you mean it's not important? But he went on to say, I will ask you if you will promise to love each other 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, because the moment you say I do to each other, it's no longer your love that sustains your marriage. It's your commitment to your marriage that sustains your love because love is a choice. It's a decision. And I remember thinking, that's really cool. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> After 49 years of marriage, I know what that means. You know, yes. Is love a commitment? Yes. It's also a feeling. I get that. But we need to, you know, I said, I, I encourage couples to, to write their own vows, but make sure what they write is, can, be, can be authenticated, backed up by scripture. Well, and I, and I think you're right, love, there is a feeling to it. Absolutely. But you've got it in the right order, right? That feeling can come from commitment. It can be a choice rather than just a mere momentary feeling going, oh, I've fallen out of love with you. I'll go find somebody else. Yes. No, no, no. I've made a commitment with you. I choose to love you. And as you walk in that, you find that, oh yeah, you do feel that too. Maybe not the same level when mm -hmm. my wife catches all my beard hair in the sink and I ran off to, to you know, to do my other job too quickly or, or whatever. You know, that's a humorous example, but there will they'll be real fights. But from yeah. that covenant commitment, oh, then a choice can lead to real lasting love. And it's beautiful, not momentary and fleeting. And it's, it's Amen. safe and, and, and wonderful. When, when you read through 1 Corinthians 13, which was not written in a wedding context, by the way, it was written Amen. in a congregational context, but you can still have a personal application. Love is patient. That's a decision. Love is kind. That's a decision. It does not act arrogantly. It does not boast. It, it does, does not delight. Um, oh, but if you choose to do all that, oh yeah, under the power of the Holy Spirit, you Amen. are going to feel it. You are oh, going to feel something really special. 
that I yes. just, I think yeah. many of my generation and down are missing out on when they yeah. put the feeling, when they put the cart before the horse and they focus only on the feeling and not the stuff that causes those feelings. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And good point. Good point. And yeah. That wasn't even one of my points. <laughs> All right. One, one last point, a very practical point. And then, um, you know, some of the others, not that, uh, you know, there's a lot could be said about weddings, but if I can sneak one more in there, I know I was there. You're probably there. Some of us are by, I'm by vocational now. We got a lot going on. If at all possible, mingle after the wedding. I get that you're probably going to be a part of the pictures. Lots of times, you know, you're going to be, they want a picture of the wedding certificate being signed. That's nice. And you probably know the wedding couple, but there are probably people from your community that you don't know at that wedding. Maybe they're in the church building. If it's at the church, maybe you're somewhere else. Who knows who it might be, but this could be your time to be an ambassador for Christ with people you don't know. And we have got to intentionally get out of our shells and our, our spheres of people that we know and encounter that world around us. Sam, I offer a hearty amen to that one. There was, there was a time early in my pastoral career where I thought a wedding was success, was successful if I could get out right after I had a piece of wedding cake. <laughs> but when I started kind of hanging around and talking with people, I had some incredibly significant conversations with people in the community who would, who would reflect, hey, I never thought about marriage that way um, or, or whatever. And it, some great opportunities if you simply make yourself available um, hang around the reception. I mean, good heavens, where did Jesus perform his first miracle? That's right. Yep. Wedding feast in Canaan, Galilee, in, in John chapter 2. He hung around and, and was a guest, and he celebrated with them. I, I guess that's kind of the biblical predication on don't rush out. You, you may be missing some wonderful conversations that can plant gospel seeds. I don't know whether to include it or not, but I will. But I can remember one specific conversation after the wedding. Everyone was sitting down. I chose to stay, even though I had a, a had an early thing the next day. Uh, in fact, it may have even been a funeral. I don't remember. But um, I participated in the toast. Tiny little amount of champagne did have alcohol in it or whatever. But that led to a 30-minute long conversation with somebody who had walked away from a legalistic Baptist church who had heard mm. alcohol, loved Jesus, but it heard that that was bad. And then I'm like, okay, at the end of the conversation is, all right, now we've talked about what that means biblically, all those kinds of things. Is that really an excuse to stay away from church just because they did your wrong? No. Yeah. Whether you come to my church or not, like all of that was just, I chose to stay around and have that one symbolic glass of champagne, even though I had something to go. Uh, and I don't know where that man is now, but hopefully that made a lasting impact. We don't we don't get to know those things on this side of eternity very often. Amen. But you planted the seed, my friend. That's right. Uh, and I got champagne. So, <laughs> which I don't care for at all. <laughs> uh, you know, to be honest with you, it wasn't it wasn't actually good, but it was <laughs> this much, and it meant something to the bride and groom, and it meant something to this other gentleman, and so um, they appreciate I didn't run off. Well, that is it for this episode of the DHF podcast. This is a ministry of Disciple Heritage Fellowship. We would encourage you to learn more about our ministry at discipleheritage.org. We are a fellowship of churches ministering to one another through pastoral care. We have a Christian restoration background, and it is wonderful just to have that shared heritage, but also just to encourage one another to continue in the mission that we are called to. And we're now even planning a church, which, hey, that's what I'm doing. I'm our first DHF church planner. If you would like to learn more about us or support what we do, again, we'd love for you to come and check out discipleheritage.org.